uh, uh, welcome to those who do this, uh, particularly if this is your first time or you're a visitor. Um, if it is, don't forget to pick up a welcome pack. Now I have to tell you, your chairman has shamefully abandoned you this evening and uh, swarmed off, uh, forgetting all of his responsibilities to look after your uh, uh, family uh, uh, function. And this is the second time he's done it in 10 years. I think it's just disgraceful. So uh, anyway, he's left me in charge. So bear with me if I'm uh, around a little bit for this evening. Anyway, welcome to uh, Dorset Humanists. Uh, just a few uh, uh, special things to tell you, um, just to remind you of my instructions here. The emergency exit is through the door at the back um, of the hall into the car park. There's also an escape route to the right here if uh, anything uh, crazy happens. Um, toilets are in the corridor. Um, please take the opportunity to switch off your mobile phone. Um, um, I did have instructions about the black squeaky chairs, but I see they've been replaced this evening, so uh, I don't have to tell you all about that. Um, if it does get too hot, then we can open the windows, so if anyone near to a window feels a bit sweaty, then just do that quietly. Um, you, as you know, the meeting ends no later than 9.15, but I hope that some of you will want to uh, linger and chat, either down here, or the, the more intellectual amongst us go up to the bar and, um, <laughs> and fuel our uh, intellectual discussion with a little bit of alcohol, which is, always works well. So, this evening our speaker tonight is Johan Neyer. Johan has a master's degree in evolutionary psychology and has published a book called The Creativity Manual, the book for right-brained thinking in a left-brained world. Is that the book that's at the back there? Um, yes, and those books are available for sale at £10 each. Uh, you can pick one up at the back and uh, hand your uh, £10 over to, to see what you think. And uh, I'm sure he'll sign one for you if, uh, if you are interested. Um, at the age of 19, he had a life-changing backpacking trip to India. Since then, he has travelled extensively through South America and Asia and developed his skills as a writer and musician. Are you going to play any music for us tonight? <laughs> uh, this is his first talk to Dorset Humanist, so will you please give him a warm welcome. Uh, the second part will be what run-ins 
does the blank slate have with evolutionary psychology? And what are some of the sex differences in humans, which is a very contentious issue? Mm -hmm. And how are some of the principles from the blank slate being wrongly used in society at large? This is where I'll go into the, the work stuff. So, key concept uh, of the blank slate. Uh, so, it was also known as tabula rasa, which was, uh, it comes from John Locke, who is the father of empiricism, and he argued that the environment is key, so the environment is the main factor that influences our personalities. Uh, so, no information is pre-written, we effectively have no hardware in this sense, only software, which comes from the environment. Um, which is an idea that a uh, book I've literally just bought, uh, WSMRA deals with this in uh, The Madness of Crowds, which is an excellent read. Uh, so, everything comes from socialization, culture, education, and experience. Uh, and in the social sciences and universities, this is the standard model. So, when I got started with my evolution psychology degree, they warned us you're going to have some serious enemies in the uh, other departments. And through my time doing that master's, I didn't actually ever encounter any of these enemies, but I've seen them uh, since, uh, especially uh, following some of the uh, other evolution psychologists. Um, in fact, I did watch uh, on, on YouTube uh, Diane, Diana Fleischmann, who came to speak uh, um, a few, I don't know how many months back, but uh, she is um, one of these uh, evolution psychologists. So, uh, there are three complementary doctrines that go with the Black Box Blank Slate. Uh, the Noble Savage, which is Rousseau, which is the idea that before civilization we were actually very noble, and it's only civilization that has put poison in us and made us bad. <laughs> <laughs> and the Ghost in the Machine, which is Descartes, which uh, is the idea that uh, the, it's kind of like the mind and the body are separate, there's a, there's a duality there. Um, so here's a quote from uh, Pinker's book, The Blank Slate. Uh, the blank slate naturally coexists with the ghost in the machine too, since a slate that is blank is a hospitable place for ghosts to haunt. If a ghost is to be at the controls, the factory can ship the device with a minimum of parts. The ghost can read the body's display panels and pull its levers with no need for a high-tech executive program guidance system or CPU. The more not clockwork there is controlling behavior, the less clockwork we need to posit. For similar reasons, the ghost of the machine happily accompanies a noble savage. If the machine behaves even nobly, we can blame the ghost, which freely chose to carry out the iniquitous acts. We need not probe for a defect in the machine's design. Yes. Okay, so why is the uh, blank slate so desirable? Uh, so, uh, if you are after true equality, especially equality of outcome, which is a topic that I'll get to a bit later on, uh, it's not possible if certain people have a genetic head start. Uh, so, if we're not actually born equal, then how do you, how do you go about creating equality of outcome? Uh, blame can be placed on external sources. So, um, be blamed on society, culture, uh, parenting, and so on. Uh, if we are born with blank slates, policies can redress the imbalance. So the government can basically step in and deal with, deal with these problems. And there's also uh, a concept that uh, if uh, certain groups have traits that are claimed to be biological, they are therefore justifiable. So, I'll deal with this uh, in a minute as well. It's uh, known as a naturalistic fallacy. And, um, and uh, now I have a personal question. Do you here believe in evolution? I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. So I'm going to go very quickly through the uh, evolution section because um, I'm sure you're all familiar. So Darwin and Wallace are the, um, the, the two guys who sort of discovered evolution. And, uh, one of the main principles is that there are selective pressures in the environment that lead to great quantities of certain traits to be maintained in the population. So the genes that lead to those traits are more likely to survive, and the phrase that was coined was survival of the fittest, although I prefer survival of the best adapted. And I now have an image that will 
convince the most hardened of skeptics, anyone who didn't raise their hand, this will prove to you that evolution is real. There we have it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So uh, actually we have a nice image here. Um, our friend uh, Joshua Feuerstein, uh, that we saw at the beginning, he would say, well, you know, I didn't come from a chip. Well actually, um, we can see here that the, uh, there was a point uh, six million years ago when uh, chimps and humans had a common ancestor, which was exactly the same organism, uh, and then through different selective pressures they split up into two uh, parts. Uh, this part going on to be chimps and bonobos, this part going on to be humans, and then around three million years ago, uh, this was in the Congo River, uh, two different uh, types of um, primate splits, which are very, very similar in appearance. <coughs> The bonobo and one is the chimpanzee. Chimpanzees and bonobos though have very, very different uh, social structures. Uh, the chimpanzee is a patriarchy and they use violence to uh, resolve problems. Bonobos are known as the hippies of the animals and they have a lot of sex in order to uh, relieve those similar tensions. Uh, one of the great puzzles for Darwin was <coughs> Uh, the peacock, because survival of the fittest would assume that certain animals should tend towards camouflage in order to uh, be better hidden if they are predators and to be also better hidden if they are uh, prey. So the peacock really puzzled him and he didn't deal with this in the first book on the origin of species, he dealt with it in the second book, The Descent of Man, and one of the one of the most common ideas for this is by a biologist, evolutionary biologist called Amal Sahavi, who came up with the handicap principle, which is the idea that a bird like this, which effectively in nature has a, a red siren flashing around saying, come and get me, uh, the more, in order to be this beautiful and dazzling, uh, the bird would have to have amazing genes because if it did not, it would easily be hunted and killed by predators. But because it exists, it's what's known as an honest signal, and it's therefore, uh, if it's still alive, and a female sees one, uh, she will say, well, this guy must be good, because he's still here despite his handicap. Um, and actually, uh, they've done some very cruel tests which show that if you pluck off some of these, uh, some of the plumage of a peacock, the females are less turned on by it. So, uh, if natural selection, so this is uh, the second theory really, which is, uh, goes, goes alongside natural selection, which is sexual selection, uh, which is about main choice, and I'll be dealing with a fair bit of that today. So, um, if it was only natural selection, and uh, this is only an artist's representation, but we have this guy here, and this is a representation of the ultimate man who could resist a car crash. So if car crashes were the main selective force in human societies, we might have liked that. But uh, obviously sexual selection plays a big role in how, how we look. <laughs> uh, here we have um, a primate with different modules in, in his brain. and. Um, uh, this is one of the key concepts of evolutionary psychology, which is that we have different modules which determine different behaviors and they can evolve in different ways. So it's a modular structure. Um, and it has, uh, evolutionary psychologists track emotions and behavior patterns across 6,000 cultures to show certain human, human universals. Uh, Chomsky, uh, came up with the idea of universal grammar, which he uh, says is a language instinct. So we have a, a piece of hardware in our brain which can process grammar, whether that's Chinese grammar or English grammar or French grammar, that, that, that depends on where you're born, but the actual faculty to be able to understand and, um, and then speak uh, is universal. Uh, and so going back to the modular idea, the, uh, the mind is like a Swiss army knife with different modules that, that serve different functions, and those modules have all evolved in the brain. 
Um, so there is a lot of uh, issues with um, the of prisons, um, but here I'll a quick breakdown of what it's not. Uh, so it's not a prescription for uh, set behaviors, it's a descriptive concept. Um, and I don't think that a ought can be drawn directly from English psychology, but we can uh, look at certain behaviors and certain evolved traits and accompanying them with reason and logic, we can come up with some thoughts from that. Um, and it can help us to determine the potential success of interventions. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we're not talking about a genes only argument here, we're saying that genes play a role, sometimes a very significant role. And of course, it does not uh, advocate social Darwinism. Um, again, the ought cannot be derived without consideration for human rights. So, uh, social Darwinism is obviously the, one of the darkest uh, aspects of humanity in the last century. So, we have uh, two evolution psychologists here, two Eagles Meadies. They are the founders of the field. And it was thought, and it still is thought, that animal, animals have an instinct, but humans lost it, which was then replaced by reason <coughs> and logic entirely. <coughs> So here we have the wasting task. Um, I don't know if anyone's seen this before. Um, can I just do, try something out here? Can I get uh, this half of the room to close their eyes, please, for a second? And this half of the room, I'm going to ask you a question. Um, you can cover your eyes as well. Uh, which card do you have to turn over in order to test the truth of the proposition that if a card shows an even number on one face, then its opposite face is red? <coughs> You have to turn over two cards in the position that um, if, uh, yes, if a card shows an even number on one side, then opposite face is red. Does anybody think it's uh, these two? Hands up? Yeah. Or do you think it's these two? Yeah. You think it's these two, yes? Anyone think it's these two? <coughs> okay, so these two is probably the most common. Okay. You guys, so we had about four on that one. Uh, can you guys close your eyes, please, for a second? And you guys open your eyes on this side. Uh, I'm going to give you another example. Um, so if you are drinking alcohol, then you must be over 18. Which cards do you have to turn over to determine this? Does anybody think it's these two? No, anybody think it's these two? So if you are drinking alcohol, then you must be over 18. These two, anyone? These two? These two? One vote for that. <laughs> two votes for that one. Okay, three votes for that one. Okay, you can vote for uh, everyone in the right. Uh, so the only, the only three people who put it right were on this side. So let's go back again. Uh, so this is very, very abstract vote. Uh, which cards must you turn over in order to test the truth of the proposition? Okay, if a card shows an even number of one face, then its opposite face is red, it's this one and this one. But if you, as soon as you make it into something more, um, more relevant in terms of the cheat detection system, which cards do you have to turn over in order to test the proposition that uh, if you are drinking alcohol, then you must be over 18. It's uh, this one and this one, which is the one that actually got some correct answers. So uh, and it's a small sample size, but as soon as you apply uh, a cheap detection system, the results go much higher. I know I did it very quickly, but uh, it's this one and this one. So, um, we obviously all know that if someone's 16, they um, are not allowed to drink, and obviously uh, you can look behind this one to see if, if, if it says uh, 18 or more. So this is the wasting task, which uh, was uh, used by Tuvia and Cosmides in this way to show that we have a very uh, astute cheat detection system. So uh, in practical terms, we all know that there's someone who, uh, when it's their turn to buy the round, they disappear on the And uh, that detection system has evolved uh, in a very similar way to vampire bats. Uh, because vampire bats, uh, when they come back from feeding, they often share their blood with fellow vampires and the other vampires. Vampires, vampire bats, <laughs> they know uh, which ones have been sharing and which ones have not. So, um, 
the naturalist fallacy is um, it's a concept which says that if something is natural, then it's good and normal. Um, so, uh, so therefore, if natural is good and normal, then EP is bad because it condones such natural traits as homicide, aggression, because it, it, it states that uh, these are very natural, especially, for example, aggression in men. Here's another example. The penicillin is synthesized, arsenic is natural. So this is uh, evidence of the naturalistic fallacy. Um, so a knowledge of our nature can help us to overcome it. And it's not a justification for natural behaviors. It's, it's as I said before, a, a description. Um, this is a quote from uh, Lida Cosmides, which is that our uh, modern uh, house <coughs> Our modern cells have a stone age mind. The key to understanding how the modern mind works is to realize that its circuits were not designed to solve the day to day problems of a modern America. They were designed to solve the day to day problems of our hunter gatherer ancestors. These stone age priorities produce a brain far better at solving some problems than others. For example, it's easier for us to deal with small hunter gatherer band, band sized groups of people than with crowds of thousands. It's easier for us to learn to fear snakes than electric sockets, even though electric sockets pose a larger threat than snakes do in most American communities. So uh, there's a Oxford uh, professor, Dr. Dunbar, who shows that uh, 150 is the typical maximum number of people you can know well. And uh, so even if you have 5,000 friends on Facebook, it doesn't mean that you really have 5,000 friends. It's, you probably still only have 150, which is as much as your brain can. Character. So here's my uh, disclaimer. I'm going to be talking, uh, making some generalizations. But if, for example, I say men are taller than women, uh, I'm not saying all men are taller than all women. Uh, but on average, they will. <coughs> Similarly, uh, when I'm talking about what men and women want, I'll be working from the heterosexual position in that. Here's a graph from uh, a famous memo called the Google Memo, which was by uh, Dr. James Demore. And it shows here, for example, that if you say that there's uh, certain differences, uh, you probably have uh, two bell curves alongside each other, which are very, very similar at the mean, but actually when you get to the extremes, you have some quite big differences. So, uh, for example, men, over two, men and women over two meters, it's going to be a huge differential between uh, men and women. Uh, but what I'm not saying is, uh, all of one group is, is higher or has more of a trait than all of another. <coughs> so the, uh, the blank state versus the second part, uh, blank state versus evolutionary psychology. And so there is an idea in the, within the blank slate that from the neck down we've evolved uh, and from the neck up everything is socialized. Um, as you were saying, um, so can we uh, afford to ignore the wealth data on other animals? Uh, evolutionary biology and animal behavior have a lot to tell us about human behavior. And yes, we accept that if evolution shaped our bodies, uh, how can it not have shaped our minds in some way too? Uh, and going back to the selective pressure, selective pressure in hunter gatherer environments shaped human behavior. And we'll cover this a little bit later, but men and women have different biological drives due to different selective pressures. So, so this would say that men and women are different in some ways. Hardwiring. So here's a, a good example of uh, evolution psychology is the idea of sugar. And who here likes cakes or chocolate or sweets or some kind of ice cream? <coughs> Okay, a lot of people. So, uh, in hunter gatherer terms, fruits, uh, sugar existed in fruit, and fruits were very scarce. So, hunter gatherers who were drawn to fruits, and this probably, this would have gone back to earlier primates as well. Um, there are some ideas that um, the evolution of to, to see colour. Uh, evolved from a uh, co-evolution between 
fruits and early primates, as fruits got brighter, early primates began to get their color vision back because the very early mammals did not have or do not have color vision. So uh, color began, began to co evolve as a offering from the fruits with primates eating them and spreading their seeds. Uh, so, uh, and but sugar itself as well. Um, if you have two hunting gatherers, one that loves potatoes, for example, and one that loves mangoes, the one who's obsessed with the mangoes because they give you that immediate energy and um, instant nutrition, whereas the potatoes, obviously it's a good nutritious food, but you have to take it back, you have to cook it and prepare it. Uh, the mango gene, for example, would have been passed on, uh, and that's why so many humans are obsessed with sugar and everywhere you go you can find sugary drinks, sugary foods. So, and there's no ossage. So in the scarcity environment of um, the Galarua world, uh, there was no need to, to evolve an ossage. I mean, I know I've eaten so much chocolate one time, but I just feel a bit queasy, so there was a kind of ossage there, but uh, has anyone else done that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Um, but um, we didn't need to evolve an ostrich because of the scarcity. So, uh, whereas now we live in a world of abundance which causes serious problems for a lot of people because everywhere you go you can find sugar. Uh, so the environment is known as the, uh, the environment where hunter-gatherers evolved, which was over 90% of humanity, is known as the environment of evolutionary adaptiveness. And uh, those selected pressures would have shaped our psychology. So this was this would be a natural selection example of how a certain psychology evolved, and we will deal with some sexual sexual selection examples later on. Um, on my course, you were shown a fantastic documentary called *The Truth About Black Lions*. It was on a, I don't know maybe. Years ago, did anyone see that documentary? It's a two-part series. Um, fantastic, but they're very, very honest. Um, and it showed us that lions are a matriarchal society, so it's mothers who pass on the pride territory to their daughters, even though it's that's a little bit counterintuitive since we know that it's the male lions who are more aggressive. Um, but there is a certain age, which is a bit like the Lion King, where uh, the male lions are forced to leave their pride. And actually, if they try to stay, they actually get a little bit attacked and they have to, they have to get out. And uh, this is uh, the evolutionary reason is uh, in order not to impregnate their uh, siblings. So uh, there's a biological force to send them away and they have to go out. Uh, a bit like a Kuna Matata, that kind of vibe, except not with a little warthog in a near cat, at least that's what he is. Uh, but actually, they have to develop skills and form alliances and develop their strengths in order to, uh, in order to be ready to take over another, another pride. Uh, this is where it gets a little bit dark. So, when they get ready, they, they try to take over another pride, and lions can actually count. So, one of the uh, evolved reasons the roar of the lion is uh, to show the strength of the male lions in that pride. So if you have, even if you have an old dying lion, but it still has his roar, he can signal that you know this pride has a strong, um, a strong force to it, and other lions will stay away. As soon as they hear those roars getting weak, uh, this is work by Chris Packer. Uh, the other lions will be ready, the other male lions will be ready to try and take over. So they're actually counting and listening to the quality of the roars. Uh, at which point, if they are successful, they will take over the pride and they will immediately kill all the infants, which is, as I said, one of the dark stages. And this will actually bring the females surprisingly into heat. Uh, they will then be ready to start mating. And uh, if lucky, those lions that have taken over a new pride have a few years to fend off other rivals, um, to, yeah, to, to bring up their offspring and get them over the two-year mark. 
Um, so they, it's, a, it's a race against time. So, um, so that's it about the Mayans. But we do, um, and territory is key. So one of the, uh, the key ideas in this uh, documentary is that uh, there are certain points where the rivers meet, which are called confluences. At those points, as you can imagine, uh, if you had even if you just had three points, that central point would be an optimal place for uh, for hunting because uh, you could build your territory around that central confluence because you have water for drinking, but you also have the other animals that are drinking coming down those three different ways. So uh, if they can protect that real estate and pass it on to their daughters, this would be a great thing, and that's that's what they they did. Uh, there are some uh, lessons we can take. So there are many parallels with um, and many mammals. Uh, in mammal species, the, it's the males that have to leave, uh, in social species, it's the males that have to leave the, the nest and find their way outside of the nest. Um, and we can also learn about certain traits. So lions are the only fully social cat. Uh, cheetahs are semi-social, uh, which shows us that seeing as all the other cat species are solitary, uh, or mostly solitary, uh, socialization of lions involves at late, a late stage in the evolutionary process. And cats were generally antisocial or non-social animals, um, but lions evolved socialization. And this, this ties in with the previous idea, maybe this was, was to protect the territory. So, I'll just uh, go back a second. So this gives us a certain clues about uh, humans because humans also do this exact same trait. That they try to pass on their property to their offspring and keep it in their, in their family line. Um, so we have a evolutionary biologist called Tim Bergen who, who poses the question why, why do certain animals have certain behaviours and he came up with four answers so you can actually answer this question on four different levels. I'll come to that in a second. Um, so uh, does anybody know what's the biggest determinant of child abuse in a family? Being abused? No? What is step yeah. So stepchildren uh, stepchildren and uh, this is connected to the biological idea that if a child is not the biological, we don't, um, men don't kill their children as they do in li uh, lions, thankfully, but uh, we, uh, there is a lot of mistreatment of their children by, by dads. Um, so, um, I have a question as well, which is not answered for me, but uh, what if wealth acquisition is a mismatch? So, as we said earlier, the sugar, the sugar, um, Situation is a what we call an evolutionary mismatch. So we didn't evolve an off switch, which leaves us open to the modern world where there are an abundance of sugar. And maybe an interesting question, which I which I don't have an answer to, is wealth acquisition could be this too. We don't maybe we don't have an off switch for this, which results in certain people wanting to accrue more and more wealth. Um, so the world of scarcity, no off switch. So here, we go back to the Tim Bergen point. Uh, why do birds sing? Well, there could be four different answers to that question. Uh, these two would be within the, what he calls the proximate realm, and these two would be in the ultimate realm. The proximate is, uh, or is a mechanistic force. So in the first one, it's uh, hormones that create the urge to sing, if you like. And also there is the current utility, what benefits do those birds get from singing? Is it recognition? Is it signaling to men? Um, and then the other two are more of a zoom out perspective. So a lot of evolutionary psychology is looking at the zoom out perspective as well. And we have also have two answers to those questions. One is that it's a stage in the development of that animal. And another is that there are certain uh, groups. So the, the black ones here are present and the white ones are absent. So in this particular concept, you would probably say they're non-singing birds, but with separate evolutions for, for singing going on there. Um, similarly with, with cats, as we 
discussing that. Uh, and one of the other biggest obstacles of, um, of the blank slate is that there are certain human, human universals which were documented by Donald Brown and features in the blank slate. So here is a list of some of the universals that go across, across cultures. Um, I'll give you a second to read that. Okay, so the contention issue of sex differences has uh, become a very political issue in the modern world. Um, sexual dimorphism, so this is the idea that different sexes have different properties and traits to them. Um, so, in the uh, hunter-gatherer world, males and females are both under different uh, selective pressures. Uh, for example, mothers are maybe more caring because the men were doing more hunting, the females would be spending more time closer to the uh, central point of that, of that group. And as such, they, mothers have much better, uh, and women have much better responses to body language, to uh, basically much more sensitive to, to what a baby wants and needs. Um, and we have here the ratio of polygyny. So uh, we're all familiar with the idea of polygamy, which is the idea of uh, many partners. You can subdivide that into polygyny and polyandry. So polygyny is uh, one male, many females. Polyandry is uh, one female, many males. Uh, there are, in nature, there are more examples of the one male and many females, but you do have examples of uh, the opposite, such as certain types of fish, where the, the father is the one that gives the greater parental investment. So the, the mothers actually take the eggs and leave them in the mouth of the father, who then nurtures them. And in that case, the fathers will be, uh, the mothers will be uh, polyandrous. Um, so we have the uh, elephant seals, um, which uh, have a, a ratio of up to 40 males to each, sorry, 40 females to each male, and the males grow to up to four times the size. So this is the biggest difference, biggest example of uh, dimorphism in nature, and it also has the highest ratio of males to females. What this means is because you have approximately one male for every every female in, uh, in nature, in most species. This means that you have bachelor beaches of... Uh, <laughs> I actually drove there, uh, when I went to San Francisco, I actually drove past the beach and I stopped off and there's, a, there's just a, a beach of males who basically go off and sort of die and give up on life and they, they just resign themselves to that life of bachelor. Um, anyway, move on. Uh, Gibbons. Uh, have a, an equal size, and they have a, uh, they are more much more monogamous species, and um, they tend to form uh, lasting partnerships. So here we have a male and a female elephant seal. So uh, humans, uh, males and females, are the same species, obviously. So uh, we have much more in common than we have different, uh, and the majority of traits are identical. So this is the most important point, uh, but also I would like to state that the differences are very important too. Uh, and ignore, ignoring these differences can cause undue suffering. So, uh, question for the audience, what's the minimum, uh, if, you, if you imagine that hunter gatherer world, what do you think is the minimum parental investment for the mother before she can leave the child to be looked after by the group? Human strike. Okay. That's approximately yes, approximately five years. Yes. And uh, what's the minimum parental investment for a father? Five minutes. <laughs> okay. Five minutes. Okay. Technically, that's technically that's actually the average. Anyway. Let's, uh, let's move on from that. Uh, so, going back to the, the fish and the, uh, the uh, other points, the parent who invests the most is the sheep.
anesthesia. So in the case of that fish, I uh, forgot the species of the fish, but the father invests more, he will be doing more. Choosing humans, it's the mother who invests more. And let's not forget that, uh, well, let's ask the question, uh, in humans it's women, what's the maximum parental investment for men and women? Uh, is anybody still looking after their children? Are there 18? Any older? <laughs>
uh, what Mrs. Coolidge requested. And uh, Mrs. Coolidge said, is it the same hen every time? <laughs> <laughs>
also cheese units. So this goes back to uh, the Trivers research I mentioned earlier, for rental investment. Uh, and so there are, there's a slight split between what, what women want. Good genes versus good dad. So good genes, so they uh, want men uh, who are very attractive so that they can have sexy sons in order to pass on their genes. So if you have a sexy son, that son will be more likely to uh, reproduce. And, um, and as we said earlier, that evolution is about survival and reproduction. So not only do you want your child to survive, if you only want your child to survive, he could look like the, uh, the artist guy that we showed earlier, but he also needs to reproduce as well. Um, so uh, there are certain masculine traits that are representative of good genes, uh, which are features muscular dominant. Uh, and the problem with these types of guys is that they are less committed because they have more, they have, they have more choice themselves. Um, good dads or good providers, uh, so the, the, the evolved um, desire for this was to be looked after during pregnancy and afterwards uh, provided with food, um, especially during the, the testing time of motherhood. And um, so this will provide enough provision. Uh, the problem here is the problem that evolutionary, our evolutionary mothers faced was that the two in one was hard to find. If they did find them, that would be great. So uh, in the arts, we see uh, this is a common theme in romance where you have a sexy man, powerful, attractive, and her role is to seduce him and turn him into a long term committed mate, uh, the best of both worlds. So, this would be in the plot lines that the story such as Pride and Prejudice and Fifty Shades of Grey. Uh, um, so, we have uh, four faces um, here. and. Um, Faces are being manipulated, so it's the same face. Uh, this one's being manipulated to be ultra masculine, and this one is uh, much more on the feminine side. Uh, if you ask the women which one they prefer, they still prefer slightly on the masculine side, but depending on what day of ovulation they are, they will go uh, more on this side uh, uh, during the peak days and more on this side during. Yeah, you, you've said there that more or less that the implication is that there is a complete difference between look, being good looking and being a good provider. Mm -hmm. But do, do not women look for a man who's. Are, are the criteria for being good looking the, cri the same criteria as being a good provider? Well, uh, the, problem, the problem is that I mentioned that is that if you are good looking, then you have less requirements for commitment. So that lack of commitment is a problem because if that man then goes off and switches his resources to another woman, that can provide a, uh, a, a okay. massive problem yeah. for, for that. So um, what women want, or what men want, uh, I've never seen this film, but it's <laughs> <laughs> a good slide, I've seen. Um, So men have many gummies. Um, and so their primary focus is on a woman with good genes. So even though there probably is some requirement for the good mother, uh, if they can spread their seed many times to beautiful women, then that would be just fine. So there are certain traits that show uh, youth. So youthfulness is very important because it is a symbol of uh, fertility because, uh, as we mentioned earlier, the biological crops of men and women are different. Uh, and uh, universally, the the waist to hip ratio, which is when you take the size of the uh, hips and you divide it by the size of the waist. Uh, whether it's uh, in cultures where men like sort of thicker women, if you like, or slimmer women, uh, that ratio stays, stays around the same. And uh, one of the things that men look for in short term is easier. So one of them, <laughs> easier women like it. Um, and so uh, one, a uh, problem that, well, this, this could be useful for some of you. Uh, <laughs> one problem that uh, women have when they, uh, when they don't know how to deliberate a uh, potential rival, uh, if they say, oh, uh, she's such a slut, that uh, woman, that is actually having the opposite effect <laughs> to the desired one. Um, in the 
long term, uh, men, as I said earlier, men and women are uh, much more similar because they want to bring up a child together, and so the requirements, the fussiness, if you like, choosiness, is much more similar in a long term relationship. So men and women are actually very similar. And I didn't mention on the slides that kindness and intelligence are two of the traits that go across, uh, across the two genders. <coughs> And I mentioned it earlier that in self phenomenon is something which would only exist in men. So, uh, okay, I'll come to my um, final section, which is the new, the new religion. And uh, when I went through those stages of um, realizing that I was an atheist, which, which happened during that Joshua Feuerstein video, um, then I discovered that we may be going out of the frying pan into the fire. And uh, religion was very important in my school, and I really did loathe it back then as well. But the new religion seems to be the, the being woke religion. And here are some of the, the things that have been replaced. So original sin, which is the, I'm sure you're most familiar with that, which is the idea that you're born with sin, you're born evil if you like, and uh, you need God to uh, relieve you of that. Then, uh, this has been replaced by privilege, whether that's white privilege, male privilege, all these different types of privilege, so you can still be born evil or born with darkness and things like right? uh, Blasphemy laws uh, existed in the past, these are now being replaced by political correctness, so we still have speech laws, speech codes. Uh, we've broken one set of chains to be replaced by another, uh, and for example, science. Denialism used to be the biblical denial of evolution, and now it's become a denial of biological basis for nature. Uh, this, this is going into the even more controversial territory of intersectionality and cultural Marxism. And, um, and also, I think these are three ideas that go together, intersectionality, cultural Marxism, and postmodernism. Uh, the two at the top, for me, they're almost synonymous. And I uh, will give a quick breakdown of what they are. Uh, but it, tied, it all ties in with uh, Foucault, who was a, a postmodern thinker, and he saw everything in terms of power. Um, so, therefore, everything is, is a power struggle between uh, different groups. Um, and another idea from postmodernism is there is no truth, there is no objective truth, everything is subject, subjective, which is uh, deconstruction. Except obviously the rule of art, the they hold. So we have here the matrix of oppression. So white people are the privileged group. So you've all oppressed me so far tonight, according to this <laughs> principle. Um, but I've also oppressed the women in here, and so on. So it's, it gets very, very complicated. Um, and. Um, so you have intersectionality means you add up all your privilege scores and then you add up all your uh, pressing, oppression scores and you put them together and that gives you your value, if you like, as a, as a human. And one of the prominent thinkers of um, this is Judith Butler, and one of the problems with postmodernists is, I think, personally, I think they speak so much nonsense that they have to condense it in very dense language uh, barely able to understand. So the move from a structuralist account in which capital is understood to structure social relations in relatively homologous ways to a view of hegemony, in which power and issues are subject to repetition, convergence, and rearticulation, brought the question of temporality into the thinking structure to mark the shift in the form of Althusserian <coughs> that takes structural totalities <coughs> in which the insight into the contingent possibilities <coughs> inaugurate a renewed conception of hegemony as bound up with the contingent sites and strategies of the articulation of power. So I understand. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to get it. So if anyone you understand, me, you understand I understand that. No. So uh, the idea is that it's, it's incomprehensible because not much sense behind it. If anyone at the end has a good understanding of that, please do tell me. Um, so are imbalances natural? So yes, I would admit that sexism, racism, bigotry are real phenomena. 
Um, do they explain most of the differences between races? Uh, should there be, here are some questions, should there be 50% representation <coughs> in all fields? Um, difference in IQ, as I said earlier, there's no mean, no difference in mean IQ, but males have the greatest spread. <coughs> uh, different preferences account for much of the difference in career choices. And this is a very contentious area. Sam Harris talks about this a lot as well. So going back, getting into these preferences. So the ability area is very controversial. But actually, a lot of it can be defined by the preferences. So um, women have a preference for people-oriented jobs. Men have a preference for thing-oriented jobs. Uh, some of the multivariate differences can be put down to this. Uh, and one of the issues with this is that things oriented jobs are more scalable, uh, unlike people oriented jobs. Uh, so, needless to say, equality of opportunity as opposed to equality of outcome is gender blind. So, if you have a society with equality of opportunity, then those differences won't matter because you, you will allow the best to rise up regardless of if it's gender blind, color blind. Um, so STEM subjects have taken a lot of uh, heat recently, uh, but I think it's a clever ploy because it ignores uh, people-oriented sciences. So there are certain areas in science which are dominated by females. Psychology is one of them, and uh, the numbers in medicine and veterinary science are also over 50%. So obviously, veterinary science is animals, but it's the same, the same concept. Uh, and this debate ignores preferences in the STEM debate. So, I already mentioned that one. So, uh, and this is another point for Peterson. The countries that have done the most to redress imbalances have the greatest differences between men and women. So, in countries like India, you actually have almost similar numbers of engineers, with males and females, because survival is uh, a very key aspect in those societies. Uh, as you demolish the uh, the opportunity gaps that, that uh, arise, actually, you find that. Um, women who become, for example, nurses and men who become engineers, those gaps uh, begin to get even stronger, which is the exact opposite uh, to the hypothesis that it's society that's holding back men and women in those fields. So people versus things. And this is a very, very good point from a, uh, it's from a Quillette paper, a big article that I read. Uh, women who have a mathematical ability are often accompanied by linguistic ability too. So if you have a mathematical ability and linguistic ability, then uh, uh, sitting in a room uh, on a computer all day would probably be quite tedious. Whereas um, the men who have the mathematical ability often don't have the accompanying linguistic ability. And uh, I'm coming towards the end now. So the Google memo was, was a memo by Dr. James Moore. Uh, and this memo highlights sex differences and highlights some ideas about how to bring women into tech. He was promptly fired from the company <laughs> for publishing this. Um, and uh, but Miller, uh, Jeffrey Miller, suggests that his analyses were very accurate. Um, Ninety percent of prisons are men, and similar for bricklayers. So do we want to uh, have fifty percent of women as bricklayers and fifty percent of felons as women too? And over 50% of GPs are women, so do we want to reduce that number? And similarly, the vets' uh, understanding uh, of differences would reduce the alarmism, alarmism about these gender disparities. Um, so finally, let boys be boys and girls be girls. Uh, rough and humble play is quite normal for boys. Um, boys fight more often, but the significance of those fights. Uh, smaller. Girls fight less, but when they do, the few can last a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yes, so when, uh, so even, even in the young age, uh, boys will begin to start searching for status and stop thinking about their looks. It goes into the, the desires of the opposite sex, which uh, as we discussed earlier, men are much more looks orientated and women are much more status oriented. So uh, it's natural in a way for, for the different uh, sectors to choose different things to focus on. Uh, and I would say it's not a 
pressure is derived to the natural uh, okay, part of the natural order. Um, I think yes, you can apply or change what the opposite sex likes. Uh, attraction isn't a choice. You can't choose what you're attracted to. So uh, lying to kids about um, the fact that they, you know, for example, lying to uh, a boy and saying that you don't need to worry about status, or lying to a girl saying you don't need to worry about your looks. I don't think it's going to help them in the long run to find <laughs> happiness, which which does partly come from from being with those people that you're attracted to. And uh, I'm just concerned about time. How are we do time? Yes, we're fine. So here we have um, even in verb monkeys, we can see that. So one of the arguments is that, um, is that it's all socialization that creates. For example, boys play with cars and girls play with dogs. But this phenomenon actually exists in other primates, such as verb monkeys, where there is a boys to like cars and the females to like dogs. Similarly, with baby studies, uh, babies will, baby girls will look at a doll's a face for longer, sorry, and baby boys will look at a, a mechanical object for longer. Uh, so, Jordan Peterson and the Gap. Uh, agreeable things to be correlated to salary, <laughs> which partly is not one of this multivariate problem which women face, uh, which is that they are, women are more agreeable than men. So, if you think that's a bad thing, well, you know, that's up to you, but I mean, that's not necessarily a bad thing, these are just objective realities. So, part of the work that he said he does, does in that famous interview with uh, Kathy Newman is that he, um, he helps women to be less agreeable and, and move forward, so they get, get promotions that they want and they pay rises that they want. Um, and this brings us right back into the equality of opportunity versus equality of outcome in the debate. Uh, do we want opportunities to be equal or do we want outcomes to be equal? You can't have both. So if someone says they're after equality, well, you really have to break down to which type of equality that is. And I've already mentioned this about status. So, uh, for example, with the CEO's debate, uh, working in 80 hour week, uh, does anybody think 80 hour week is a reasonable? Way to live. <laughs> okay, no one here does, but uh, men are at that uh, much more in that bracket where there's two uh, bell curves of the extreme men, who, of the extreme people who think that it's acceptable to work an 80 hour week and sacrifice uh, one's life to get that. Uh, for women, that's less of a on average, especially in the extremes. So, male dominance, um, so this is an interesting point from Miller. That's uh, the idea that in mammals we had certain uh, male and female roles. This was then magically disappeared, and then the patriarchy then instilled these exact same concepts on society once again. Uh, so this is a, an issue, uh, and this concept is very similar to Peterson with his lobsters, uh, which is the idea that even uh, lobsters have. Uh, to process antidepressants. So the, the makeup of the lost brain is similar enough to humans in the sense of, of finding status that um, antidepressants work on lobsters, but not only that, yet the lobster, if it loses a fight badly, it will actually dissolve its brain and regrow a new one, which is a submissive, a submissive brain. Clean your room. Okay, so I do have a book at the back, if anyone's interested, <laughs> and uh, it does have certain elements of evolution psychology in it, but it also um, touches on the evolution of creativity. Uh, and uh, yes, that's a better look back. It also covers some of my travels as well, because, uh, as we mentioned earlier. And I'll leave you with a, um, a quote from, from Pinker. The strongest argument against totalitarianism may be the recognition of a universal human nature that all humans have innate desires for life, liberty, and the pursuit for happiness. The doctrine of the blank slate is a totalitarian dream. Mm -hmm. So this was actually used by the uh, Khmer Rouge, which uh, was, was the blank slate was one of their, one of their key ideas about how to program their, their society. And
Some of it comes from, who it does come from, culture. So, for example, 
um, for example, a fear of there was a, an experiment on a little uh, baby called Little Albert. I don't know if you know that experiment. And they uh, gave, it's a very cool experiment back in the day, but they gave the uh, boy, uh, baby boy, these little fluffy animals, and uh, he was playing around with them. And then at one point they smashed a uh, symbols together when he was with them, this loud noise instilled a, a mechanism which made them scared suddenly of all these other rabbits and mice and whatever. But that would come from, you probably wouldn't be able to do that with an electrical socket because an electrical socket, we don't have any of that wiring. So certain things like fear of snakes and fear of spiders, you probably do need some exposure to that thing in order to develop it. But since you have that, you can build it up quickly. Whereas, like, uh, an, uh, for example, a uh, gun should be much more scary than a snake, but most people would be more scared than a snake than a gun. Depending on the way we look at it. I think <coughs> the theory falls down, in my opinion, where males who have one female, surely a lot of that goes back to possessiveness, which comes from the animal instinct. If a lion kills a gazelle, he eats it. If anything else comes near, whirr, and drives them off. That is like possessive greed. And then again, you've got to consider the fact that there are certain, and not many, I know, but certain African tribes where the women have sex with as many men as they can to become pregnant on the basis that then 10 or 12 men don't know if they're the father, so they all provide for her. <laughs> okay, um, so yeah, so there are two points within that. Um, I would I was going to deal with the possessiveness point. Um, jealousy is definitely a very strong human emotion. So uh, whether that's the, the female, the male who has that jealousy, um, in fact, it gets almost too much of a bad rap. The, the emotional jealousy, because um, if two members of a uh, relationship show no jealousy whatsoever, they're actually statistically less likely to stay together. Uh, a certain dose of jealousy actually does help to keep a relationship. Obviously, it does get, um, does get um, uh, sort of psychotic at a certain, certain point, which is why it's very, very damaging. But a uh, certain doses, I would say, is, is beneficial. Um, so, yes, possessiveness is a natural phenomenon. And, uh, and uh, going to the second point, uh, as far as I know, there's only one, uh, I'm not sure about this. Uh, I'll try to mention that there's only one culture in the world where uh, they have polyandry, which is in, uh, it's in, it's in Tibet, yes. And uh, in that society, it's when two brothers are too poor to afford a, enough land, so they, between the two brothers, they have one piece of land, which is enough for a wife, and the two of them will uh, be married to her. And because they're brothers, uh, her, her offspring will have uh, a 50% uh, relatedness to one father, and then the other brother will still be his nephew, which is a 0.25% relatedness. But I, haven't, I, I do know that chimpanzees appear. Uh, in an African tribe, and we practice that, yes. But I, I'd say pretty shrewd women. <laughs> okay. I don't trust because I'm just going to stand and talk. Okay, uh, just a point about uh, the connection, the connection between uh, sugar and vision. Uh, my understanding of it is that the uh, evolution development of the craving for sugar is related to vitamin C. Primates are one of the very, very few uh, animals that cannot synthesize their own vitamin C. Uh, therefore, the, the lust for sugar is related to the necessity of getting environmental vitamin C, which may in turn have be related to, uh, to colour. Okay, that's a good point. Thank you. Hmm? Very good. That's true. That's
Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, more than likely. <laughs> okay. My understanding was that um, humans were much more uh, similar, as you said in your slide, to the bonobo. And my understanding of the bonobo monkey was that they have multiple, well, it's almost like a hard, a, a polyamorous situation. Mm, yeah. And, and is that not why? I understand the human vagina is the only one that can segregate different s sources of sperm. Um, so the actual, the, the natural selection is taking place inside the female body. There is definitely, yes, the, the, the buccal sperm was, which which gives uh, <laughs> into that. Because <Yeah. laughs> um, is it the truth that pre ejaculate actually is designed to kill off any sperm that's already in there? There's a certain mm -hmm. amount of that, <laughs> and yes, yeah, different types of sperm, including. And this is perhaps my understanding, of, you know, following on from what you're saying, where perhaps that's where the female has that more sort of intuitive um, aspect of their personality in order to identify which spur, source of sperm is actually more um, desirable in terms of offspring rather than based on looks. Um, so. <laughs> Okay, so okay, I'm gonna go. That's fine. Okay, so the uh, so if we can think about the, uh, the female orgasm, which is um, something that has evolved over many years, and one of the ideas is that, well, firstly, if a woman does have an orgasm during sex, she's much more likely to conceive. Uh, but secondly, um, this would also be uh, the reason why well, men have very uh, short amount of time required to. To have an orgasm, whereas for women it's much more complicated and takes more time. Uh, where, well, if, if, if in the evolutionary past, if a man was able to create an orgasm, this would show some of those one signals of fitness and skill, if you like, that would uh, be good, good genes as well, be a symbol of, of those good genes. And obviously, she would want to come back to that. But I think my understanding was that the part of the process of the orgasm, that was where the potential was to say, to, to eject certain sperm and take on other sperm. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not so, I mean, yeah, that's, I'm not so familiar with that. Okay, so, no, thank you. Great talk, thank you. Uh, really enjoyed the pace. So.
for men, sorry, sorry for men, I don't speak all of women. Um, and my understanding is that IQ is, there's, there's significant evidence that IQ is, uh, follows on from kind of uh, material wealth and, and material differences. Um, so, for example, I read an interesting study about uh, Indonesian farmers, where you had uh, Indonesian sugar farmers, would, um, before they were paid, um, would, their IQ would be 12 points lower than uh, seven days after they were paid. Um, because people who are stressed and people who are in kind of difficult material circumstances uh, exhibit to perform worse on, on IQ tests. Um, could this not be, for example, in this, this gender IQ distribution, this could be an example of what you were talking about with um, the, that you have more men at the top and more women at the bottom. It's not necessarily a biological difference so much as a difference of resource distribution. Oh, uh, we also have more men on the very lowest end as well. So That's what I mean, yeah. So I would say that. Yeah, I would say that I wouldn't think the argument really uh, works against us because why would why would that why would that make men more extreme on both sides? Because you have more men who are have a large amount of wealth and uh, more men at uh, the opposite end you have more men who are lower. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I haven't really thought about that. Is, isn't the answer to that point that? You know, the proper IQ testing is normalised to make sure you that everybody's had a good, uh, 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 you know, properly fed and not stressed when they take the test. So, you, the, the, the this gentleman's suggestions are the the aberrant uh, when 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 uh, the, the testing hasn't been thoroughly carried out in the way that we would in schools. Can you separate that from? Society as a whole, in general, meaning. Um, yes, well, certainly educationists think we can, or, or, or the whole like, end of this IQ testing would fall. Uh, I would say one thing, which is the Flynn effect, which has been going on for since the beginning of IQ testing. Uh, as we do become more materially rich, uh, the IQs are probably less education improved. They've had to keep resetting the IQ score. So um, IQ is based around the number of 100, which uh, every now and then they have to reset that 100 in order to, because um, it keeps jumping higher and higher. Although I'm also aware that that is also peaking right now, and we may be beginning to become more stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Streams of uh, blank slate followers to the extremes of the evolutionary followers. But most modern psychologists believe there's a 50 50 nature and nurture that's sort of going on with people. And people have to learn their social behavior. You know, people are taught to get on with each other. You know, you couldn't, you know, a bond office wouldn't survive without people who were tolerant to each other. So there must be some uh, social influence in it. Oh, yeah, um, well, yeah, I'll say to be clear that uh, evolution psychology does believe that there is a strong uh, impact of environment as well, uh, but in different areas that will be stronger and, and weaker. So uh, height, for example, is definitely very strongly... Um, or on the physical side of things, but on the social behavioural side of things. Well, but then the, you know, these, these uh, female and male preferences would definitely be strongly influenced by genes as well. So because of the selective pressures that would exist in the hunter-gathered world. Um, uh, for example, and this ties in with the, the jealousy idea as well. Um, um, the state of the, the things in Africa where the mass state of the maybe this uh, is a problem for all, all men will face this problem, no women will face this problem of genetic diversity. So uh, men have to uh, look for uh, in a long term mate, one of the things that men will look for is a woman who shows that she is not so promiscuous. Um, and so, so yeah, this, this is partly why men are so keen on, on long term partners who are not promiscuous, whereas uh, selective pressures for women would be 
um, it would be far worse for her partner to fall in love with another man than to have a one-off affair with, with another man if, if he still loved her. So uh, that's a different selective pressure. So actually, uh, there's some research which shows, uh, which is uh, from a book called Dangerous Passion, which is David Bass. Um, I don't know, but uh, the um, the idea is that yes, that men have much more. We, men and women both have strong feelings about sexual or romantic infidelity, but for men, it's worse for a woman to have his partner to have a sexual infidelity than a romantic one, and vice versa. Okay. I'm talking about sort of people learn stuff in so social behaviour that isn't necessarily you know, as important. But the um, so the so you're sort of presenting two the opposites. I'm saying there's a faculty for some yeah faculty because these things are evolved, but it's uh, nature can be imprinted on uh, the nurture can be imprinted on that as well. I'd like to know what Marx had to say about any of these topics and how he got posthumously dragged into the debate. Okay, so that's a very good question. Um, so I would say that people like uh, Foucault, as you mentioned, uh, they are they're sort of taking some of the Marxist ideas of oppressor and press and applying it to a uh, different set of. So the, uh, the argument is that. After Marxism clearly failed in the, the Soviet Union and around the world, uh, the Marxists had to come up with a different way of presenting their ideas, and this leads you to the thinkers such as Foucault and other uh, postmodern thinkers who, who are actually applied the Marxist theory, but instead of having the oppression and the oppressed as the bourgeois and the proletariat, they now have whites versus non whites. Uh, straights versus gays, um, men versus women, and so they've, they've taken the same uh, basis of that. So it may not be Marxism in the political sense, but it, it's definitely an evolution of, of these ideas that they definitely find of, of his thinking. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Of women that are engineers that are in Norway, that, that, that's 
well known, is it? Because uh, yes, I, I, I don't know if you've used that term quite. Um, it's much closer. The difference is between because uh, there's a lot, yes, there's a lot more pressure for survival uh, in those in those environments. Well, my understanding is that in, in India, women and girls are not treated very well at all. And so, how how do they achieve that? Yeah. Um, well, having had a heritage, I would say that uh, for, for most Indian families, being a doctor or being a lawyer, regardless of, mm -hmm. of, your, of your sex, is the, the ideal. So, whether you're, whether you're a boy or a girl, I have to do more research into the stats. In the list behind you, mm -hmm. on influences, I can't help noticing that 99% of the people are there. Can you explain why there are so many distinguished women anthropologists and other stuff? That's a good point. Um, I would say that uh, the current situation which in academia is based on social policies of 30 or so years ago. And if we looked at this uh, future list in 30 years' time, mm. based on quality of opportunity, we would find much closer to 50 50. Thank you. Yes, your talk is reminding me very much of a show I saw a few years ago called Defending the Caveman. And okay. it was Mark Little, Australian comedian. Going around, and he sat in the middle of the stage in his shorts in a deck chair and he defended the caveman. And he explained that in caveman days, the cavemen, they just had one job to do. They had to go out and kill some game and bring it back to feed the tribes in the caves. One job to do. But they had to get in a little huddle before they set off with the other men to say, you go around the left, you go around the right, and, you know, and that's the way we'll capture it. But it meant that they didn't develop their communication skills at all because they had to concentrate on the one job. But actually, when they got to do the job, they were actually all in competition with each other because the one that got the knife in and killed at the end of the day, they got much more sex when they got back to the heads because they were the hero. So men, one job, no communication, competition. Whereas the women were all back in the caves and they were saying, here, more, do you? You look after the babies, and we'll go and pick up some crops over there. And Jenny, if you clean out all the caves, and then we'll we'll tell you know the men when they get back that I did this and I did that. But actually, we shared it, and we'll spend lots of time sitting and gossiping anyway in between the things that we did. So that the women, they were multitasking, they were cooperating, they were you know um, communicating. And although it was a sort of it was humorous thing, but it was sort of true. And I think, you know, women in my career, I've worked in the city and in areas that are very macho, you know, the men are always, you know, I'll do with this first and, you know, then I'll get on to the next task. Whereas the women were always sort of multitasking and maybe not doing each job as brilliantly as the men did, but they did seven jobs where a man had got one job done. But, uh, anyway, so women are superior. That's what we're we'll out to. So is that another question? It is, yeah, that's all right. Oh, just, just one more. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll do it. No, 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 it's all right. Yeah. Uh, just in case it was, I don't want to. Um, <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Uh, uh, Jordan Peterson, uh, you mentioned him saying that um, the agreeableness within females is stopping them um, raising, right, right, uh, raising in uh, salary levels. And that Jordan Peterson's um, solution to that was to make them less agreeable. Yeah. Why I don't like Jordan Peterson. Wouldn't the solution be to form a society where agreeableness is the thing that's rewarded, not lose it? Um, that would require a very top-down, sort of overpowering sort of government, which then decided that you can't, uh, you, you wouldn't be able to just impose that on society unless you did it in a very top-down manner. I would say. Uh, perhaps, yeah, but the, the alternative is that we don't have an agreeable society. It's, um, it becomes more. Um, I wouldn't say more unequal, just more. Horrible. <laughs> I mean, there are there are different roles where agreeableness is required. So it's not it just happens to be the ones where the most money is that agreeableness is less required. There are huge amounts of fields where agreeableness is actually an important part of 
part of that, of that role. But it shouldn't be monetarily rewarded. Uh, so if you're talking about what shouldn't, shouldn't be monetarily rewarded, you're, you're moving into the political realm of, uh, yes, again, going back to the overpowering government, which I believe is uh, about redistribution of uh, wealth as opposed to the market forces. If two people are negotiating, the most agreeable person is likely not to get as much as if he was less agreeable. I mean, that, it's just the way two examples of any species uh, is, is, is going to fight out the debate. I'm, I'm more optimistic uh, about uh, humans. Think you, I think you're making it a bit black and white, what people are saying. Okay, I think we'll move on now. No, another question? No. No? Okay. All right, well, I think that was a fascinating talk. Thank you very much. And covering an area we haven't covered in quite that sort of depth before. So, everyone, let us thank again. So, a few announcements. But first of all, I should just mention um, Sandy Toxvig, who you will know.